Hey, hello everybody. I'm uh, broadcasting from my basement here in sunny Eugene, Oregon. And it's really fantastic to have everybody with so much interest in this subject that you're willing and, and enthusiastic to spend some time, a good amount of time, thinking and studying about this, this subject, quantum physics and what its possible applications can be. I can just say that, that I've always been, ever since, this, ever since high school, I've been really fascinated by the subject of quantum physics and light and photons and understanding that those deeper questions. And that's what I spent my, you know, most of my career studying. And now with the opportunity for quantum physics to create a new revolution in uh, technology, it, it's really exciting. Uh, I'd like to remind people that there's usually a 30 to 60 year lag between fundamental physics discoveries and their actual applications, uh, especially in, in the commercial world. And we're now seeing that happening in, in quantum physics in a, a whole new way. So what I'm going to do uh, right now is uh, switch over to my, I'm going to uh, share my screen. I'm going to switch over to um, the, 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 the slides here, and I see I forgot to go back to page one. So we'll go to page one. I'll go full screen. And right now I'm gonna, I see the little gallery of people on the upper right corner, which is covering up some very important information. So I'm gonna minimize that little window. And you can, you can set that little window such that you see no, nobody's face, or if you click on a certain button there, you might be able to see my face in the upper right-hand corner while I'm talking. It might make it easier for you to, to follow what I'm saying. So here, and, and, and um, I'll ask Amy uh, Sudeshan to, to uh, chime in at any point where it looks like I'm on the wrong page or things are not showing up as, as I think they are. So thank you, Amy. And, and as Tina said, if, if any of you participants have questions, uh, please write a question in the chat window and Amy will, will monitor that and uh, you know, re relay your questions over to the group. Okay, so this is a six week course. We're meeting uh, twice a week for about two hours e each session. And there, there's the, this is a beautiful picture of, um, of one of the lasers that one of my PhD students built in our laboratory. And he's also a, a, a hobbyist photographer. So he took this picture and we used it on the book cover. So I'm very happy to be um, uh, assisting the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials in this exercise. Okay, so here's the book. Uh, here's uh, Amy Sudarshan's uh, <clears throat> information. Please mute your audio to avoid feedback for questions. So everybody uh, mute now, except perhaps for Amy, if, if that works fine. But then remember, if you, if you are asking a question later, put it in the chat window. And then if we ask you to say something, you have to unmute your audio. Okay, so this is the, the schedule uh, that you, you've seen in some form. And right now we're on July 6th, the introduction. And then there's Thursday and um, et cetera. So I will be putting all of these uh, lecture slides um, into the Google Drive at the CQM website so you can review them later and not have to write too many notes down. Okay, um, so as I said, I'm not going to read through all this. You can uh, view this later on the, uh, in, in the documents. Okay, so I just want to point out that um, uh, all of you are spread quite, uh, quite broadly uh, throughout the country and we even have a participant from Korea and we have some participants, some special guests um, from, from Germany that you'll, you'll meet on Thursday. So it's really fantastic to have such a, a broad, diverse group coming from many different backgrounds, very different levels, all the way from high school up, up through uh, PhD levels. And people have different interests in, in this, um, this activity, I think. But I think all of us do it because we love teaching, we love learning, we love quantum physics, and it's exciting. I'm going to pop into this um, slide here. So how did the US National Quantum Initiative come about? Well, I show a picture of my colleague from the University of Maryland, uh, Chris Monroe, and also myself there in Washington, DC. 
about two or three years ago, we, we started a project to lobby the US Congress um, to support quantum science because other countries were starting to invest large amounts of money in a very uh, coordinated fashion. So what we did uh, back in 2016, um, uh, we, we attended a workshop at the White House run by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And this was at the end of the Obama administration. And then when the new administration uh, took over uh, soon thereafter, um, well, actually before that, we started organizing a, a lobbying group funded by the National Photonics Initiative. And uh, we, we started sending proposals to the, the US House, the Science Committee. And then uh, in June of the following year, uh, we, we, we were asked to submit a, um, a plan which we called a call for a national quantum initiative. And that went to the US, uh, science, uh, US House Science Committee. And then in October, the US House uh, held a hearing, one of those formal hearings, and we got to go in, in, into the Congress um, buildings and, and see a formal hearing. That was a lot of fun. Get to meet a few Congress people. And uh, people, including Chris Monroe, testified uh, to, to the, um, you know, the, the Congress people. It was great. And then in April, um, they asked us to submit a more detailed plan. So we wrote up a more detailed plan. And when I say we, this was a committee of about 10 or 15 um, prominent academics from around the US, uh, plus prominent uh, industry people like IBM and Google uh, uh, and Intel, pe people like that. And we wrote this plan, submitted it into the House Science Committee. And uh, then in June, um, the Senate uh, passed the bill. It was unanimous. Everybody loves quantum mechanics. And the joke that I like to tell is, is is why why there were no Congress people who tried to oppose it, and the answer is because they didn't claim to understand it. Then they, they couldn't say this is all wrong. You know, you you got you, you got the the I and the minus one in the wrong place. So they all said this is great. We can have new technology. We can have new education. Everybody supported it. Okay, and I I think I see a. I think I see a chat question. Is that true? How do I do that? Oh, it's not uh -huh. a question. Excellent. Okay. Good. You heard my joke. Okay. So then uh, the House of Representatives passed the, the same bill, also essentially unanimously. And I actually got to watch those on live on, on YouTube, you know, to see when they voted and everything. And then in December, um, the, the, uh, it was signed into law by the by the president and authorized over 1.2 billion dollars over five years but in the in the in the two weeks before it was signed into law there was a very interesting development and and that was that uh, ivanka trump uh, the daughter of the president and one of the white house advisors actually uh, tweeted that the national quantum initiative act was passed in the senate and uh, we're looking forward to it uh, passing the House so uh, real Donald Trump can sign it. So we appreciated uh, Ivanka's uh, supporting of that. And then here's a picture of the president with his signature and Ivanka and then on the left is uh, Michael Kratzios, the, the um, director of the Office of Science, Science and Technology Policy and one other important gentleman. So I, I like the expression on the president's face there. He's like, this is really cool. This is quantum physics. I don't know what it means, but it's all good. Okay, so now um, I hope you all have a physical notebook. If not, grab a scrap of paper and a, and a pencil. And uh, I encourage you to, to keep a physical you know, paper and pen notebook if, if you like to do that kind of thing. And um, this gives you an opportunity to write for 30 or 60 seconds, what do you think quantum information science is? Give examples. I'm going to time this. I'll stop there. And then rather than discussing it in the group, because it's a little bit difficult here on Zoom, I'm just going to go through this, my standard summary of what quantum information science is. And you can see if that lines up with, with what your conceptions were. So there are three pillars, the quantum computing, quantum communication, and quantum sensing. And uh, we, we call this new revolution quantum 2.0 because quantum 1.0 was things like the laser, the semiconductor, um, atomic clocks, 
but none of those use entanglement or quantum superposition. Now the next generation, which is what we're now trying to develop, does use quantum superposition and entanglement. So we need to learn what those are. But first we'll talk about some of the applications. Okay, so quantum sensing. If you have a, a what we call a field, a force field, it can be magnetic, it could be electric, it could be a gravitational field, it could be other things. Um, you can use the sensitivity of quantum systems to sense or to detect uh, very precisely the value of those fields. And this can be used for many different things like biomedical imaging. You, you, can, you can image the magnetic fields and electric fields within a sample. Uh, you can measure strain in materials. You can measure gravity very sensitively, which allows you to do improved um, you know, geo prospecting and archeological discovery of structures under the ground. Uh, if you have a really good accelerometer, you can navigate yourself without having GPS because an accelerometer simply records the acceleration and the direction of every movement that your instrument makes. So if you put that into a submarine or into a vehicle, you, you can track your location uh, just by integrating up equations of motion for acceleration. That's really cool. Um, uh, so here's some pictures of um, quantum sensing, atomic accelerometers, uh, diamond nanosensors for uh, that's a Harvard one. The accelerometer is a Stanford one. Uh, the diamond nanosensors for biological sensing. Uh, I'm working on a project uh, with the University of Illinois um, on uh, using quantum techniques to enhance the, the range and, and, um, act, and um, resolution of uh, telescopes, actually. That's a challenging project. So now we go to quantum computing. Um, you know, in, in, in physics, most problems are defined by a Hamiltonian, which means the energy um, of each object um, in the system and how they interact. And it turns out that you could use a quantum computer to simulate um, any physical system uh, if you know what its Hamiltonian equation is. So you can use that to simulate molecules, condensed matter, quantum field theory, et cetera. Now, of course, we don't have a quantum computer yet, um, but we're working towards that. Uh, you could use it to do pattern recognition, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, optimization problems, um, factoring uh, numbers, which is important for uh, data encryption and, and decryption. Those are the more familiar examples of quantum computing. Um, quantum communication. No, no, here's a little bit about um, quantum computer, just an example. So. One way to build a quantum computer is to use individual atoms. Each atom represents one bit. Okay, so here's a photograph, and then an act, in the blue, it's an actual photograph of 50 single atoms, which are actually called ions because they, they have a, a plus one charge. And so you can trap them in a magnetic field in a vacuum chamber between those two um, blades, not knife edge blades. And um, each atom has an electron and electrons can spin and it can spin clockwise or counterclockwise relative to some chosen axis like the, the vertical axis in the laboratory. Um, now, if we have just 50 atoms, each one can be in one of two states the number of different states that can be represented by this quantum memory register is two raised to the power of 50, which is that very large number in the green box. And in fact, all of these states in the memory can be represented simultaneously. And, and there's no digital computer that could represent this kind of information at this level of large quantities. The problem is it's not so easy to use those numbers. The way they're embedded in the quantum state is, is not so easy to manipulate and to read out. This is, this is why we had, don't have a quantum computer working yet. Okay, um, now in this ion trap implementation, um, you know, computers work by gates. So you have two bits and you have to do an operation like an add operation or an XOR, exclusive OR operation. Well, the way they do that is, is um, they shine lasers. Uh, they can shine a laser at any two of these ions and they can manipulate the spin of the ions and make them interact and implement the gate operation. 
And we'll talk about that much later in the course in week six, okay? So now let's go on to quantum communication. Um, we're interested in having more secure communication. Um, you know, privacy, like who are you really talking to? Is that the right person? And do they trust who you are? And if I send data, can that be fully protected by encryption? Um, remote quantum computing. So not everybody can afford a quantum computer. So can we log in from San Jose, California onto a quantum computer in Washington, DC? Um, we need to have a way of doing that. And also we want to make that um, secure so nobody can hack in and, and observe what it is you're computing. Distributed quantum computing means if I have like three really good quantum computers, I want them to work together as a team to solve a problem that one computer couldn't solve by itself. That means you need to communicate quantum information between the three computers. Um, blind quantum computing, I mentioned that before, that's where you have privacy um, on, on your computation. So this is what we call the quantum internet, which does not exist, but we're working towards that. And the idea is to have a, a bunch of optical fibers or other links connecting nodes. Like here I am in Eugene, Oregon. Well, actually over here, Eugene, Oregon. Some of you are uh, over here in Boston somewhere. There's Florida, I see. And of course, in, we could use optical fibers to connect those. But the problem is that the quantum photons don't travel very far in a fiber, maybe 100 kilometers. So like at this white node here, you need to have a quantum repeater, but that's very hard to build because if you measure the quantum state of an object, you destroy the state. Therefore, if that quantum object, like a photon is entangled with another photon in Boston and you measure it over here in Wyoming, you destroy the entanglement. So this is a really big research challenge. How, how do you do a quantum repeater without destroying the entanglement? And people know how to do that in theory, but it hasn't been demonstrated in the laboratory. And then we need switches and then we need applications and, and so on. This is copyrighted by University of Arizona, this picture, because I'm part of a, a team that's um, um, competing for funding from the National Science Foundation to try to build a, a test bed to, to build a, a quantum internet. In fact, uh, Tina uh, Brower Thomas is also involved in that same team. So now uh, Tina mentioned uh, the nine concepts of quantum information science. And th these nine emerged from a, a two week long study that the National Science Foundation carried out. Tina and I were both involved in that. And there's a report, which I gave you a link someplace earlier in this, this slide set. Uh, you can go find that report and, and read that. It, it's meant for educators. It's meant for people, say high school and junior colleges who want to teach quantum physics and quantum technology. And this is the guide for showing what the community, what the scientific community thinks are the most important concepts that should be taught at that level. So we will discuss all of these topics in the next six weeks, at least at some level. Okay, so now we go to the physics. Does anybody have any uh, questions uh, if you, so far, if you do uh, put one in the, uh, the chat window since we're now changing uh, gears here. So some of, uh, most of you have probably read parts of chapter one where I discuss this experiment in the book. And the idea is you have one atom, like one of those ions that's levitated in a vacuum chamber and you send a very dim beam of light at it. Could be a light bulb, could be a laser, it doesn't matter. And then some light is, is emitted or scattered from this atom, goes through this, this little hole in this, this dark screen. So it's traveling in a well-defined direction and it hits a beam splitter. Now, a beam splitter is simply like, um, you know, like uh, sunglasses where, where you have a partially silvered um, sunglasses. So some of the light reflects from it, uh, but some of the light can also transmit through it. And we usually use a, a beam splitter that transmits one half or 50% and reflects one half or 50% of the light. Okay, so this experiment has been done. In fact, on Thursday, uh, you will see um, a live demo uh, being broadcast from a, a company in Germany that builds a very nice system for demonstrating this kind of experiment. And you'll see that live. 
but for right now we have a zoom poll. Um, for this experiment, which detection sequence or sequences can be observed? Here I show two sequences. Sequence one, where the X means that uh, one of these detectors, A or B, uh, registered a, a, a detection. And um, you can see there's some differences between this sequence one and this sequence number two. And we're assuming the time slots are very short. So I'm going to now turn on the zoom poll, relaunch poll one. So you should all see the zoom poll on your screen. Now it covers up the page. So what you can do is you can grab it and you can pull it down, grab it from the top bar, pull it down off the screen so you can see the whole content. And then I can see some of you are already quickly answering these questions. <clears throat> we have 10 of 19. We have 13 of 19. 10 more seconds. Okay, five seconds, four, three, two, one. Okay, click. We will end the poll and we will share the results. Okay, so I hope you can all see that. Uh, if not, Amy can tell me. But um, the most people voted for option one and a couple voted for option two. So I will stop sharing and um, I will turn off this poll. So since most of you got that correct, I will just advance through it. If many people didn't get it correct, I would maybe back up a little bit and discuss it further. If we were in a classroom together, we would simply discuss it. But on Zoom, it's not very convenient. Um, we might consider later having breakout uh, groups to do that kind of thing. But this is a simple question. So the answer, in fact, is one. And you can see that what that means is that at any given time slot, uh, either there, neither detector clicks or just one detector clicks. But typically, well, almost never would you have both detectors clicking. And that's just a result of the experiment. Okay, so I'm not going to try to give you a theoretical description of why that's true. I'm just going to say that's what people observed in experiments. And this proves that uh, de de detection of light tends to be random and also tends to be discrete. Um, but at this point, we can imagine that it's, uh, we don't know quantum physics. We're 100 years ago and it's unclear to us what is the origin of this randomness. But we do experiment and we simply observe that. Okay, so another zoom poll, which detection sequence can be observed? This is a case where there are many atoms here and our dim light beam is, is scattering light from many atoms, which goes to, to these uh, detectors. So let me start the zoom poll for this one. Um, two, mm -hmm. Okay, I hope you can all see that zoom poll number two. We don't see the zoom poll. Do not see the zoom poll. No. How do I, it says poll close. Oh, I think I need to relaunch it. Yes. Yeah. Now? Yeah, we see it. Good. Okay, five seconds. Four, three, two, one. I shall stop the poll. I will end the poll and I will share the results. Okay, now it's, it's a kind of a split decision in this case. It's a little bit equal. So what I'm gonna do, instead of wasting time on a breakout room, I just want you to think about this a little bit yourself and, and see if you can, um, if you want to change your vote. 
what I will do is I will um, I will relaunch this poll. Okay, think about that and and consider the fact that there are many atoms here, and atoms uh, behave independently. Let's say so each atom can do whatever it wants to do, and see if that hint will lead you to change your your answer or not change your answer. If you have the right answer, don't change it. Okay, go ahead and vote. Okay, five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, stop in the poll. In the poll. There we go. Share the results. Okay, um, so more people uh, voted for option two, and in fact, that is correct. Very good. I'll close the polling. I'll click through here. But the answer really is either, if you think about it. Because, you know, answer two is, is probably more typical, but there could be just um, by accident, um, number one could be true, just, just by chance. Uh, there, there was never coincident detections. So sometimes I might throw a little tricky question at you like that. But that's fine. There's no grades, doesn't matter. Okay, here's a little, maybe a little, um, little different one. So we have the same beam splitter set up and we, uh, we call these clicks. When, when a detector uh, registers a, a detection, it's like the Geiger counter and it, which goes click. So sometimes we, we call them clicks, uh, but really in the laboratory, it just goes to the computer. You don't really hear a click. Um, so say the photons pass toward a beam splitter at an average rate of one per microsecond, okay? We denote the probability to hear a click at detector A in some time interval, say one nanosecond. We denote this probability by PA. So either detector A clicks or doesn't click. And the probability that it will click is a probability that's somewhere between zero and one. And likewise, we have a probability PB that the detector B will click or not click. We denote the probability here clicks at both detectors A and B within the same one nanosecond time interval. We call that PAB. Now we define this important quantity called G2. And everybody in quantum optics knows what G2 is. It's a very common thing. It's the ratio of the probability PAB divided by the probability PA times PB. So using your intuition, in guesswork in our previous discussion, we have just one atom. What do you think should be the value of G2? Zero or one, or there's also a third possibility there? Dr. Raymond, okay. before you start the poll, we actually yep. have a question from one of the students that ask, are we assuming that only one photon goes through at a time? The only one what? Photon go through at a time? Um, well, it's similar to what we had on the first poll question. And the fact that we have dim light hitting this atom and there's only one atom, it turns out that when the atom uh, absorbs and emits a photon, then it takes a while for it to recover. It's kind of like the atom got a little bit tired. So it's not gonna emit another photon for another few nanoseconds. Okay, so in any one nanosecond interval, it's, it is true that there's only one, one, I'm not gonna use the word photon yet, but there, there, there's only one event happening from the atom over to the beam splitter. Okay, so now what I have to do is I have to launch pole three, like this, launch pole. There we go. Another follow-up question from the student. They asked, what about when there are multiple atoms? That's a different question, which is, is not um, part of this uh, Zoom poll. So let's put that off till later.
Okay, we have 13. That seems to be the, the, the standard number. So I will, I will end this poll and I will share the results. And uh, we have one very honest person. That's great. Doesn't have a clue. And we have a, a kind of a split among different um, answers. So let me just give you a little more discussion. As, as we said before, <clears throat> only one photon can pass through the slit at a given time. And light detection is discrete, which means it happens, you know, either at one place or another place, but not at both places. So now it's just a matter of understanding what the question is. What, what are these PAB and PA and PB? So I'm gonna just rerun the poll because I gave you plenty of, of, of hints. Relaunch the poll. Okay, please uh, do it again. Okay, five seconds, four, three, two, one, in the poll, share results. Yes, and that in fact is, uh, yeah, mo most people now voted for, for zero or, I, yeah, which is correct. That, that is correct. So fantastic. Um, zero is correct. And the reason is, just in, to say it in words, PAB is the probability that both detectors click. But if there's only one particle of light traveling at a time, then it's not possible for both detectors to click. Therefore, that probability is zero. Good. Now, conclusion so far. Uh, randomness of light detection, and it's still unclear what the origin of the randomness is. We haven't really talked about photons or quantum physics. We just said, this is what the experiment is. And so now at least you all know what the experiment does. There they go, random clicks, okay? And discreteness. In other words, the click happens at a particular time. It's not like it's very long, spread out, wave, like continuous pro a process. It's like a Geiger counter. It either goes click or it doesn't click. That's called discreteness. So we can make up a, a model for light, which we can say from this experiment that it looks like light is made of particles because you could think of a small particle going through the, the, the hole and it either goes through the beam splitter or bounces off the beam splitter. And that would explain why only one of these detectors could click at a given time, if there's one atom. Now, somebody asked in the chat window, what happens if there's more than one atom? And that's similar to the earlier Zoom poll, which says that if there's many atoms, then uh, multiple atoms could emit a, a light particle um, at the same time. And so then both detectors could click. Another possibility is that maybe your experiment is not in a light tight box. And over on the far left hand side, there's a light bulb that you forgot to turn off. So that light bulb could be emitting extra light through the slit and exposing the detectors. So in, in that case, we, we might see multiple clicks um, at the same time. So there's different reasons wh why there could be multiple clicks, okay? Uh, so we have this picture that light is composed of indivisible particles, which, which have been called photons. Um, but really, uh, photon is, is a more technical term. Uh, we know what photons really are, but at this early stage in history, people just thought of them as, as particles. But that doesn't mean that, just this experiment by itself doesn't mean that light is composed of particles. It's consistent with it, but we will see it's not that simple, right? So what we can say is that when you detect light, it behaves as if it's composed of particles. There's clicks, they're discrete. Okay. Dr. Raymer. Yes. There are some questions about the discreteness of photons in the chat. Okay, let me see. I can, um, I can pop up the chat right here. I can also ask the students to share them in the voice chat if you'd prefer that. In the, in the voice? Okay, let, let's, let's try that. Let, let's, um, Alex, would you like to um, unmute your, 
microphone and ask the question verbally? Yeah, I was just on the contrary. If the photon didn't act as a particle, but acted as a wave, uh, would we well, see? That's a, that's a well-known um, fact uh, to, for people who know it well, uh, which is one of my jokes. But right. um, we're saying, I'm right now taking the viewpoint that we're experimentalists uh, doing this experiment 100 years ago. And we have no, no clue that, that, um, that photons would act as waves. However, if you know history of science, it's, it's also known that 100 years ago, people did observe interference from, of light. And it's not hard to detect light interference. And so there was already this question back then, um, was light made of waves or particles? And of course, quantum physics has, has answered that, that question uh, quite nicely, at least mathematically. I'll give the answer, okay? The answer is neither. Photons are not particles, they're not waves. Light is not particles, light is not waves. The whole quantum thing is completely different from any classical description you can put onto it. Gotcha. However, it's still true what I said earlier, that when light is detected, it's, it, detections are discrete and indivisible, and so it behaves as if it's particles in that particular experiment but in other experiment, it doesn't behave that way. Great, thank you. Good, thank you, Alex. So now you can remute. And um, then there's a question from uh, Thien who says, so in this case, PA plus PB equals one. That's a very nice comment. Uh, and that is uh, true. If I go back, which I don't seem to be able to do right now, but yes, if 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 detector um, if it's true that one detector always clicks, um, oh, but that's not true, is it? Sometimes, remember, if you have this atom, right, it's being exposed with dim light. In any one nanosecond time period, that atom may or may not emit a photon. Therefore, PA plus PB does not add to one. It might add only to 0.5, which includes the, the, the cases where there was no photon emitted. So, okay. Um, just to clarify, PA stands for the probability of detector A clicking, and PB stands for the pr probability of detector B clicking. Yes, and there could be another one called P nothing, which is the probability that nothing clicks. And the sum of those three probabilities does equal one. Good, okay, let's move on to the next Zoom poll. So we say a steady light beam with one watt of power is sent onto a photodetector, creating clicks. Now go to the poll and the question is, after observing the behavior for a few minutes with one watt of power there, you now decrease the light power to one half watt. What will you observe? I think I need to show the possible answers. Uh, now I will start the poll. When I say loudness, th think about a Geiger counter. Uh, imagine that you hooked up your detector to a little speaker that made a little click on some event. Okay, five seconds, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's share these results. Um, Amy, what do you see on the screen now as far as the sharing results? I see percentages of who answered which um, answer choice. And you see a, a blue bar for each of the four possibilities? I see a blue bar for the least three popular um, possibilities and an orange bar for the 
Oh, wait, no, that's just my answer, I think. Yeah, hmm. I see. Sorry, so. I also see an orange bar for selection B. Okay, so it is an orange bar for the most popular choice. The most popular, okay, okay, I which think. does not necessarily mean the correct one. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Interesting. Okay, right, so B is the most popular, it says the click loudness stays the same, and there are half as many clicks per second. So let, let me just say uh, that it is true that the click loudness stays the same, because as I said, it's, it's like a Geiger counter. If an, some event happens, it just goes click. Okay, but now not everybody agrees on the, the latter half of the answer. Are there half as many clicks or uh, the number of clicks uh, per second stays the same? So I've now narrowed, narrowed down the, the correct um, choices and I'm gonna run the Zoom poll again, let you think about that. We changed the power of the light between these two trials. Okay, five seconds. Four, three, two, one. In the poll. Share the results. Okay, we still don't have a unanimity. So I'm just gonna give you one more hint. What if I were to turn the light power down to zero watts? In other words, I turn off my light power. What would that do to the number of clicks per second? Just think about that. That should give you a big hint as to what the answer is if you just decrease the light power to 0.5 watts. I'm gonna run it one more time. Okay, five seconds. Four, three, two, one. End the poll. Share the results. Okay, we're, we're definitely getting there. And uh, the, the hint was supposed to uh, imply that the, the number of clicks that you observe uh, is you know, linearly proportional to the power of the light striking the detector. So for example, if I block the beam with my hand, so there's no light hitting my detector, the number of clicks would be zero. So the number of clicks per second would not stay the same. Okay, so, hope you understand that now. So the answer is um, there are half as many clicks per second because the power of the light is, is half as big as it was before. So hope you can absorb that if you didn't click on the right answer then. Okay, now I wasn't sure how far we would get um, today, but um, we moved pretty quickly. So I'm going to go to a warm up for week one, day two. Hope everybody's with me. So this be, this will be the experimental demo that we'll see. And, and this will be our presenter, uh, Henning Bayer who is a scientist um, working at a company in Germany called Q-Tools. And they have some really beautiful um, products there for um, research and education. And there's a, there's a link here if you want to go look at that um, later. And I believe Henning might be monitoring our discussion right now. So recall that what we saw was if we label, we're gonna relabel these detectors now B and B prime instead of A and B. You'll see why that is later. Um, it's to be consistent with the, <clears throat> the demonstration. So we've already concluded that when light is detected, it behaves in some way like particles. And there also appear to be indivisible particles because one 
particle of light when it hits the beam splitter either transmits or it reflects. That's what we mean by indivisible. But it turns out, and this is something that's not usually discussed in, um, in classes. I'm going to check the chat window here. Chat. Um, okay, okay, the students from UCSP have to leave early. Um, we'll see you on, on Thursday, and I will review this material again quickly on Thursday. Goodbye. Okay, so this statement that light particles, which we call photons, is indivisible, it, that was thought to be true for a long time, and it's consistent with the idea that light is particles, so it's, it's a nice sort of teaching or pedagogical way of thinking. But it turns out in modern days, we have learned that's not exactly true. Old, old type of experiments is what we call linear optics, and the more modern experiments are called nonlinear optics. And we'll discuss what that means. But it basically means the interaction is very strong. So in physics, you know, if you push, if you perturb a system like a harmonic oscillator very weakly, we say its response is linear. Namely, the response is directly proportional to the driving force. But if you push a, a harmonic oscillator like, or like a swing or a pendulum uh, very hard, it, its response is no longer linear and its amplitude could depend on the driving force in some way that's not simply a direct, um, uh, direct um, linear relationship, not linearly related. Um, so when the interaction is very strong, you can get into a different regime. And then it turns out you can divide a photon into two photons of lesser energy. And uh, this is a very useful tool in quantum optics and quantum information technology. So that's why we're discussing this. It's not in the book. Okay. You're getting the secret treatment here. So there's a nice, there's two nice analogies I can think of. One is if you have a baseball and you hit it with a bat really under extreme conditions. Well, if you hit it hard enough, you could actually split the baseball into two pieces. But if you hit the baseball really softly, of course, it's not going to split. Now that's like a particle picture, but now there's a wave picture. And we've hinted earlier that light is also since it displays interference, you should also think of that it has wave-like behaviors. So let's do a classical wave-like or oscillator uh, demonstration. So I want you to all to try to do this experiment at home before Thursday. Um, we have a pendulum, so you have to find a piece of string, tie some little heavy object onto it, and then mount some kind of an object with a small hole in it, and you can run the string through it. Now you want to clamp this small object like a bolt washer onto the side of a table or something. So it's pretty rigid. Now this pendulum, if you just let it swing, it has a resonance frequency called F. Let's say F is one cycle per second. And that, that, that frequency will depend on the mass of this object and the length of the string. So let's just say you measure that. You just let it swing back and forth at, at, at one cycle per second. Now what you do is you start to pull this string up and down at twice that frequency, at two cycles per second. What's going to happen? Well, what you're doing here is you're changing a parameter. The parameter is the length of this string segment. And if you change the parameter in time, we call that a parametric process. It's driven by varying a parameter. And when you do this, it turns out that to be quite interesting. If, if, you, if you put the, the object at rest at the bottom, so it's not moving, and then you start driving this string up and down at 2F, you'll see eventually this object will start to oscillate at, at F, one half of the frequency at which you oscillated the string. That's a classical oscillator analogy. It's, it's fun to do that, so I hope you can try it. Now, mo moving on to optics. If we have a certain kind of a crystal here, 
we have to buy these special crystals from a, a scientific supply store. And um, we put blue light into it. And you know, blue light oscillates twice as fast as red light, typically. Like blue light is, has a wavelength of 400 nanometers. Red light has a wavelength, say 800 nanometers. That's a factor of two in the wavelength, which means the frequency is a factor of two. So this light is oscillating the electrons inside this crystal. The, the electrons can move up and down inside the crystal. And it's like the analogy with the string when you oscillate it at 2F, you can generate some kind of signal at 1F. And that's indicated by these two paths here called A and B, signal and we call herald. Now over here on the right, I have a little cartoon that I made up showing what happens. So omega here is the frequency I called earlier, I call it F. It's the driving frequency. It goes back and forth twice in this animation. During that time, because the object moves on an arc, if the object is constrained because of the nature of the crystal, the, the electron is constrained to move on this arc. It can't get off of this little track. When, when the driving force goes back and forth twice, the blue ball in the vertical direction just goes down and up once. Here's the animation. See that? Pretty cool. Try that again. So that kind of illustrates what happens inside the crystal. You're driving it with this force at a frequency omega, but the electron is actually oscillating in the vertical direction at one half of that. And when electrons oscillate at a certain frequency, they emit light. So you drive it with blue light and this crystal emits red light. And this is shown an energy level diagram. The blue light has an energy equal to the length of this arrow and the red light has energy, which is half of that, omega over two. Now, what happens if you put detectors here? The question is similar to our discussion earlier about having um, single atom being driven by dim light, but now we're using this nonlinear optics method. It's a very useful technique. So here's what happens. And this is the quantum physics. Okay, what happens is you actually get a pair of red photons emitted together. Now that's because of energy conservation. If you destroy one blue photon, you have to create two red photons at the same time in order to make sure energy is conserved. So now this photon goes up to what's this detector, which is called a herald. And a herald is like, you know, in a, in a movie of the, the nights in the, uh, the night days, when somebody would enter into the king's chambers where the king was sitting on the throne, uh, some, somebody would, would, you know, give a little blast on a trumpet to say somebody's entering. And that, that's called a herald. So when this detector clicks, what do you know? You, you know because of energy conservation that there's another photon over here, which is called signal or B. And so this photon travels along here towards this other detector. So this guy clicks, it heralds it, and you know pretty, pretty well with high confidence that there's a red photon traveling in this path. So that's nice because remember in the earlier example with the atom, you never knew when the photon was emitted. But now we don't know when it's going to be emitted, but we know that if the herald detector clicks, we know there is a red photon in the signal path. And this is a very common technique in quantum um, optics and quantum communication experiments. Quantum um, uh, secure communications, quantum teleportation, and so on. But they all use this method. So then the question is, how can we prove if somebody says, oh, I don't believe you, you know, I don't believe there's one photon there, there could be two, there could be three photons. How can we prove that there's only one photon here? And this is an experiment that we all do in our laboratories to prove it, to make sure our apparatus is working correctly. So what we do is we put a 50-50 beam splitter here, and then we have two detectors. We call B and B prime. And now we have this thing called a coincidence detector. And I see I can't spell coincidence correctly. But um, th th this, this detector will tell us if both of these detectors clicked at the same time or not. 
So think about that for a second. Do you think both detectors will click at the same time? Well, you can probably guess the answer pretty easily at this point, because I said there's a single herald click, which heralds the existence of a single red photon. So you know what the answer is. But now the question is how to describe these probabilities mathematically. Now th th this is mostly omitted from the book because that's a, a simpler book. But I'll probably end here because I, I don't want to um, you know, m miss out on, on those students that had to leave early. But here's a one page crash course on probability. So uh, you, can, you can read through this um, and I'll just say that I made up this little example here that the probability that the sun will set within two hours is P of Y, where Y means the sun will set. And this symbol here, P of X with a, with a vertical bar and a Y means the probability that given the sun sets, namely Y, the moon will be visible. So X is the fact that the moon is visible. And this P X comma Y means the probability that the sun will set within two hours and the moon will be visible. And there's this very nice relationship here. You can think about that. It's pretty intuitive that this has to be the right way to formulate it. You just multiply those two probabilities together. Uh, this one's called the joint probability and this one's called the conditional probability. And we'll, we'll be using these terms in, on Thursday when we have the demonstration of, of the single photon um, source. Okay, so I will end it there. I'm sure you're all getting tired and uh, you had a lot to think about today. I will um, stop sharing my screen and go back to the, um, the Zoom page. So if anybody has uh, questions uh, right now, you can either put them in the chat window or you can unmute yourself and uh, say, I'd like to ask a question.